Thank you so much, and thank you so much for being here. I wanted to start by just asking you how this series came about, how you decided to do a TV series, how it all began. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> thank you. But I'm, I'm just so curious to know, did you like it? <laughs> A weird, uh, not weird, but a special um, experience to be sitting behind an English-speaking audience. And I wonder, did, did you notice when the when the languages switched? Uh, all right, taking cool. my questions already. <laughs> I'm sorry because I'm, I'm so curious. I was trying to to read the signs because. For example, that scene where Yaniv is sitting and they're speaking Arabic and he's getting annoyed more and more. And I, I didn't know if that came across just by... Amazing. Okay, thank you. You're such a good audience. <laughs> so, okay, your question. Thank so, you. So, <laughs> how it all began, how right. you decided to make a TV series. Yeah, wow. So, I know it's loosely based on your own experiences, yes. so just tell a us about A little bit tighter that. than loosely. Okay. Um, uh, I think we're feedbacking a little bit on yeah. stage. If you could help us with that, that would be amazing. Um, so, let's start from the beginning. I am a singer, songwriter. Somehow I bumped into acting and became an actress. Uh, you actually screened Arab Labor here at some point in the festival, I think. And I was on that. So, so I'm in the business, okay, in the, uh, for a long time. But I've never written, I mean, I, I wrote for the drawers in the house, not for TV. And, um, but in 2009, as a singer, I represented Israel in the Eurovision Song Contest. I don't know, do you know what that is? <laughs> you are a really special audience, because in America, nobody knows what Eurovision is, so I feel like I'm privileged. Okay, so I don't need to explain too much. I was representing Israel together with Achinoam Nini, Noah, who is it? Yes. Exactly, and is really Jewish from Yemenite uh, origins, a huge singer in Israel. And um, unfortunately, as we were preparing, we were not yet there, as we were preparing for the Eurovision, the Operation on Gaza cast led uh, started, and it was a really very complicated time. Um, so we were supposed to be preparing for this pop contest and people were dying uh, on a daily basis. And there was a lot of pressure on me as a Palestinian citizen of Israel to withdraw, to step down. There was a big petition on the web who was, that was signed by really good friends of mine from my own camp, from my own people, right? Um, against me representing Israel in a time when Israel is killing my own people. Uh, so, needless to say, it was re really stressful. My, my, my family was stressed about it. My, my father and my mother were scared. I was getting death threats like on a daily basis on my Facebook and, and uh, um, email and everywhere. All the channels that people can reach you. And uh, they were worried. They were genuinely worried that something bad is going to happen to me. Eventually, I decided to go through with it and go to Moscow out of the understanding that if I step down, nobody's gonna hear my side of the story, but if I go, I will have microphones, you know, in my hand, and uh, I'm gonna be asked to tell my story, and I will. Uh, so that was my choice. In... So, and, and then of course, the operation ended, da -da -da, la -la we went to, to Moscow, we participated. When I came back from Moscow, I sat with myself suddenly, you know, after such a big eventful period of time, you're suddenly alone in your house and it's like <laughs> you, you collapse. And in these days of that collapse of energy, I realized that no one, no one in the world, including my parents, could not have, didn't know what I was going through. Because even my parents, I was, I was trying to be strong for them. I was like, you know, a projecting uh, life is normal. Uh, no, don't worry. You should look, you know, we should look in the far, uh, you know, in a high, we should look far ahead. You'll see it's, it's gonna pass, nothing's gonna happen. So I was reassuring them. So I wasn't even confiding in my own parents. And no one knew the hell that I was going through and how uh, the mess that I was uh, feeling. And then I had the idea of, okay, 
So write it down. You can tell this story. So it started as a um, short movie, actually. And um, if I, finally, I got the courage after a year, I think. I got the courage to send it to a friend of mine who is a director and a scriptwriter himself and asked him, please, to review my work. <laughs> please be gentle, but I would like you to tell me your remarks. And he asked to meet me. I said, oh my god, maybe it's so bad that he needs to see me face to face, you know, not on the phone. We meet in a cafe and he says, Miro, this is not a short movie. And we're like, oh shit, my script is shit. <laughs> he says, no, 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 this is a TV drama. I'm like, what, really? He says, yeah, there's enough material. It can be like longer than this. And then he encouraged me to go and, and make it as a, and, and that's where it all started and it took, 10 years, <laughs> 2009, 2019. Thank you. One thing that really struck me while watching is the connection between national violence and personal violence, oh. right? Domestic violence, um, national violence, and I wanted to ask you about that and how you made those connections and why it was so important to you for, you know, to portray both the personal violence that Arab women go through and also the national violence. Well, women, exists. not only Arab. Of course, of course go through violence daily. Right. It, the statistics are just maddening. It's very annoying. And it's not changing. Right. With all the Me Too and whatever, the statistics are the same. And I'm very annoyed by that. So of course this, this concerns me a lot. And, yeah, and yes, it's worse when you go into more conservative societies where they don't want to you know, they want, don't want to take out the dirty laundry outside. So whenever they have domestic problems, they want to keep it in the house. They want to, you know, keep it quiet and solve it within the family. And that's not always the best way to do it because this is helping the perpetrators to go on doing what they're doing. So, so first of all, this issue concerns me a lot. And I wanted to take the dirty laundry out and to have it out and to speak about it so that our audiences would see it on, on screen and recognize their neighbor, recognize their sister-in-law, some, someone around them who's suffering and maybe get them to do something about it. So that's first of all. Second of all, violence is a humanity. And it, if it's a, on a national level or on a domestic level, it's the same violence. And we need to solve both. That, um, the fact that we turn to violence, in my opinion, is primitive. And we need to evolve and find the other ways of, of dealing with things. Now, don't get me wrong, I box, okay? So it's not that I'm like, I understand aggression, and I understand even the importance of aggression. And we can use aggression in beautiful ways, in, in ways that are creative and in ways that are productive but not on each other and not to hurt other people. So I'm not like this flower girl, so, oh everybody we should be peaceful and hug each other. No, I understand it all. I know what we need. I know we are flesh. We are not these spiritual beings, but it's time to evolve. And I want to go back to ask about the question of language, sort of how Hebrew and Eric Arabic interplay, when the characters speak which language, how the Israeli-Palestinian characters intersperse, and how that reflects... Intersperse? What is when that? that? I'm learning a new <laughs> word here. Intersperse. So, so for those of you who know Hebrew and Arabic, right, when the right. Um, when Rani and Muna speak, they often in, switch back and forth, code yes. switch, yes. right, um, Arabic and Hebrew words, yes. and so that how that reflects their identity, Palestinian-Israeli yes. identity today. <laughs> if you notice, Philippe, Mm -hmm. would never say a word in Hebrew, okay? okay. The intellectual guy with the Herzl. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> told me, no. Yesterday in New York, someone told me, that Herzl uh, character, I'm like, who? <laughs> so apparently we have a Herzl in the, in the show. So th that, that in Palestinian, proud Palestinian intellectual would never put a Hebrew word in his speech, right? Mm -hmm. But Rani will all the time, because Rani is just living life. 
and, and, and for him it's communication, he doesn't think about it even. And yes, we mix Hebrew and Arabic, exactly the, the same way that Israelis mix he, Arabic into their Hebrew without even knowing it's Arabic sometimes. <laughs> I get sometimes like, uh, I tell them, yeah, I know what the word means, it's like, it's, it's in Arabic, and they go, no, it's not in Arabic, I'm like, um, yeah, it is. <laughs> so they don't even know it's in Arabic. Uh, so yeah, we mix that, and, and this is like, it's considered our, sometimes it's considered our mark of shame in, in comparison to other Arabs, right? Because we mix Hebrew, which is the Zionist uh, language. But then I look at Lebanese and Syrians and Iraqis and they mix all kinds of other languages. So it's French or English, whatever. So <laughs> everybody's doing it, but hey. Um, so yeah, it, it tells you where the person is when you, so Philippe would not ever use okay. Hebrew, but, but our characters are more, they are Tel Aviv, they are in Tel Aviv, this is their life, these are, these are the words that they use. In the first scene, Mona catches on the fact that Rani is saying com the word complexity in Hebrew. Every time, so he's talking in Arabic, Arabic, Arabic suddenly, complexity, Hebrew. And suddenly she goes like, oh my god, you don't know how to say complexity in Arabic, right? So it's like, even between them, there are stages of how much, how much do you know your Arabic, right? Thank you. Okay, we're going to open up questions to the audience. I'm going to ask that you just raise your hand. Um, you say the question, and I'm going to repeat the question to make sure that everyone can hear. So, who has a question who would like to ask something? Everything was good. I have a question. We, uh, we'll go you and then we'll have next. Yes, and just you can say your name. My name is Anne. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is wonderful. Uh, when will we get to see this? Uh... <laughs> so Maybe the you question can... is, wait, wait, when will we get to see next? When will we get to see more? How can people see more? Well, you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love uh, for Mona to reach uh, international platforms. Uh, we're working on that. I can't but hope that we succeed to reach somewhere. I am also hoping to be able to make a second season. We don't have answers regarding that yet because of the TV business, nothing else. Okay. The other question, I didn't, uh, someone else. Same question. Oh, same question, <laughs> oh, okay. Great okay, so whether it's semantic, right, if you can tell Khan, we're interested in the second season, so hopefully. Uh, maybe I should video you. <laughs> <laughs> Boston wants the second season. But actually, I, I'm curious. Uh, that's like, you know, so this aired on Khan, right? And for those of you who don't know, Khan is sort of like the PBS of Israel. It's the like, national, it's the national station. So I would, wanted to ask you what it was like for the sort of national government station to buy this, um, and has there been a reaction specifically with that? I have to say that it was an amazing experience, very surprising experience to work with the, with the, go, with the governmental uh, national TV because they're totally seriously not affected by the politics. Mm -hmm. So I, I was happy to, um, to realize or to discover that I'm not getting any you know, dictations and nothing and they were totally for the, uh, for the artistic piece. Uh, there were no dictations politically or any others. So it was a good surprise. I'm happy to say that there's still hope. We are not uh, where we would have thought. We, okay. like, we, we had a, a, a tough time with, a, with the Minister of Culture, but it says nothing about the establishments. Okay. Thank just, you. Just a moment, when was it? When did, when did the show air? It aired January 2019. Okay, so the show aired in January 2019. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I was curious, as to what extent uh, did the actors bring their own experiences as Palestinian Israelis to the table? Is that something you were choosing actors for the roles that you wanted ones with similar experiences or to really relate to it? Or did they um, bring some of their own and that, that changed some of the dialogue and the way you approach the story based on their experience? So I'm just going to repeat the yes, question. Thank you. Um, so the question is, how did the act did the actors bring their own experiences? How did casting go? Choosing these relatively young and somewhat unknown um, Israeli-Palestinian actors, and what was that like? Um, we didn't choose the the people with similar stories or anything. This was not a thing. Actors come into the room. If they got it right, 
or got it in a, in a, not in a cool way or in a original way, if they got the part. It's like any casting um, process anywhere else. Um, so that was not part of the, I am guessing that most of them would have gone through situations similar to this and later in conversations with them, I would hear them, like Muna, for example. By the way, Muna is played by an actress called Muna, <laughs> by accident. I wanted to ask that. Yeah, yeah, so the name of the character was always Muna in 2009 already. I just gave her my initials, that's it. Muna Abud, you know, oh. that's the only thing. Um, but it was Muna Abud all the time, and then Muna Hawa comes into the room and she got the part, and so it's like uh, this divine intervention or something. Um, so Muna, as a Palestinian woman, uh, very much involved in the Israeli uh, community, of course had gone through things that reminded her, the story reminded her of her own life. Of course she had this special connection to the character because she's been there. She's been in that kind of relationship with a Jewish man. She's been in these kind of situations where as a Palestinian woman actress, she needed to be in these whatever situations where suddenly it was a little bit problematic for her or the representation thing. So they've all went through it. They're, they're all Palestinian Israelis. As a minority in Israel, you, you have these, you face these challenges of, uh, of, of a minority, of that sort, certain minority. Um, what, there was a second part of, for the question, I forgot. I'm curious, I think you alluded to it, but I was wondering whether or not Oh, if they, if they affected the... It's natural. It's natural. It's always like that. I mean, there are things that, as a scriptwriter or a creator of the... If you want it to be there, there are things that you want to be there. But personally, I welcome uh, the actor's input all the time. If, it's, if, it's, if it makes sense, more sense for them to say it that way, for sure. Because I want it to sound as real as possible. I don't, I don't worship my own words. Uh, yes, you have a question. Yeah, I, I wanted to know whether the character Yaniv was based on your spouse or how similar. <laughs> uh, so the question is, uh, what is the real life resemblance with Yaniv? <laughs> Yaniv is a combination of people. No, seriously. Uh, it's a combination of men that I went uh, into some sort of relationship with. Um, so yeah, he's, he's like totally built from three or four different people, not necessarily boyfriends but people who I knew and I had some kind of encounter with and, and, and when we built him, he, he, he's actually uh, some kind of <laughs> mishmash of... Uh, so my current um, partner is not Yaniv, no. <laughs> <laughs> Important question. And yes, I'm sorry, you had a question in the front. How many uh, episodes were there in the first... So the question is first how many episodes? Eight. 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 Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. Question is about the reaction from different audiences. I have to admit that when we, I mean, I wrote the story, so I know the story. And but when we released, I braced myself. Uh, I expected controversy. Of course, there is. But uh, I was surprised not to get hit so much. I was like, it's like I, I patted myself and I was ready to be punched, and then it didn't come. So I was like. What happened? Maybe we failed. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, nobody's angry? Mm, I don't know what's going on here. I think people liked it. <laughs> Too much to be angry. I think. Because the, the woman character, Muna, uh, the girl character, it is controversial in, in the Arab society. <laughs> She's too liberal, for sure. There's scenes with her kissing both men. Uh, even a little bit of nakedness, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy for our society yet. And also the political stuff I was expecting from the Israeli side, much more pushback. But I think somehow we managed to create something that got the respect of the viewer in a way that maybe even if they didn't agree with it, they didn't attack it, which is nice. I guess maybe finally I can rest a little bit. <laughs> yes, there's a question there. How, how much time elapsed between writing the script and then making it to television? Mm. And did, did, 
that any ever get amended in terms of more recent um, events, current events, and making it into the script? Right, so the question is sort of the time passing between writing the script and it making to television, and how, how if, and if current events made their way in in any sort right. of way. So first of all, of course, in 10 years, it's not that I wrote these, these eight episodes, no. I wrote, a, I wrote the short movie, and then when I started uh, uh, putting it into a structure of a series, I wrote the synopsis, I wrote two episodes that are completely different now. So these 10 years, when I say 10 years, it's, it's a long time, and these are years where, first of all, I'm writing, and then I am pitching, and every time I'm pitching and somebody comes aboard, uh, there, there's a, there are changes and then maybe it doesn't happen and then you go on and you pitch somewhere else and other partners come into the, into the equation and then maybe you change a little bit and you change and current events and everything. Eventually, I can say that when we got the okay, the final okay, we have producers, we have the money, we have the channel, let's start working, we brought, I brought in Maya Hefner, who is the main, uh, the, 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 how do you say, main screenwriter? Like, she's the head screenwriter. Okay. Uh, brought her in and she started writing. Um, with, together with me and the, the, the director, of course, according to the story. Uh, so that happened, I can say, it was finalized a few months before shooting which was a year before uh, screening. So it's, it, it's, it all happens, when it does happen, it all happens very close to, to the shooting. Yes. Over here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. No, you're right, it's hard to see with the lights, so thank you for... I oh, and by the way, I, sorry, yes, sorry. don't forget, don't forget a question. There's something I saw in, like I was leafing, uh, looking in the, promos for the screenings, both here and in uh, New York, and some, for some reason somebody wrote, in 2014, Mona, da, 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 we made sure that we don't have dates on which war this is, because we were envisioning the next war. It's not 2014. This is year less. This is not with the date, because we are in a constant cycle of this. So, Gaza war number one or number 13? Um, apparently we're gonna have more operations there and we were like kind of predicting the next one which you know just last week there were was, al alarms yeah, in Tel Aviv. I was thinking even so. with today's news some of these comments sounded all too familiar. Oh, you see? Yeah. Yes. Um, I was very struck by the scene of the father cutting the tree and the pain uh, that it was able to be captured and I was wondering if you could a bit more about the contradiction of my father kind of like made me this way and gave me the wings and then I'm a completely different person to what he would expect and that, that I don't know like that contradiction the pain the admiration yeah. So, yeah, so just the question is about the scene where the father cuts the tree and just everything with that with the pain the contradictions and all that went into that beautiful scene. Well, um, it's not a secret, it's based on my own relationship with my father. It's not the same like it's portrayed in the series. I took dramatic freedom. Mona is not Mino, and the father is not my father. But for sure, I based everything on this complex relationship with my own father, who was a great role model. He was not a person who did what everybody else did. He always, uh, he always made his own way in life and was a fighter, and uh, not, a, not a physical <coughs> fighter, just a fighter. He just fought for, for every, he had to fight for everything he had in life and did it very beautifully and managed to become um, an amazing person with an amazing effect and an impact on his own community. So I had that role model growing up. But then, when it was time for me to be who I am, he was very afraid that I would be doing what he was doing. <laughs> so he was like, like he was the role model for being your own person, being an individual, and then he was trying to convince me to be like everybody else. 
And, and he did not see the contradiction in that. And I kept pointing out, Dad, this is a contradiction. Because you taught me by doing, not by saying, to be my own person, to, to listen to my own truth. And now you're telling me just be like all the other girls. Just be like everybody else. It doesn't work together. And uh, we had a, 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 a complex relationship and um, a lot of ups and, ups and downs for many, many years. I'm happy to say that today I feel that we have, in a way, completed a cycle, a wonderful cycle, very inspirational cycle of, of a relationship. And today we're good friends with a lot of mutual respect and I had a, can I like to share something? I, of course. I, for my new album, there's a song called Yaba, which is Father. And it's, it portrays some sort of a, of a made up conversation that I'm having with my father, okay? And then, so I write this song and um, in the beginning he has trouble listening to it. It's too, whatever, too difficult for him. I don't push him, it's fine. But then I get an idea for a video clip that I really wanted to direct. And it included having him act in the video clip. Now my dad is, a, is an MD, he's a doctor. Retired, he's 84. So I go to my father and I said, Dad, I, um, you know, I told him, you know I can get any actor I want, right? <laughs> like I can just point, you know, Hamad Bakri, you know, Makram Khouri, Yusuf Abawadi. I can, I can bring them all, right? But I want you to act in my video clip. And he goes like, like, yeah, like okay, f f convince me. <laughs> oh, so what's the concept of the video? And I tell him the concept of the video. Uh, I tell him, listen, you are, I'm gonna shoot you waking up and then, you know, sitting in your bed, putting your slippers on, taking your glasses, putting them on, you know, looking at the time, getting up, washing your face, shaving, eating breakfast, shining your shoes, uh, ironing your shirt, putting it on, tying your tie, getting ready for a meeting. But all of this is happening outside in our olive grove between the olive trees. So you're, you're in your pajama and your slippers, but you're out in nature. <laughs> okay, he says. And I look at him and I was like, yeah, when you say okay, like I'm gonna like I'm gonna produce this now, right? I'm gonna like I need you like we need we set a date mm -hmm. and I bring a crew and we work very hard, right, to produce this. And then and that day you need to wake up and come to the olive grove and do this, right? Yeah. And you have no idea. He was the most amazing actor in the world that I've ever worked with. He was a naturally born actor. I did not know this about my own dad. I did not. He's a, he's a doctor, for God's sake. He was not, he was not an actor. He is the most disciplined actor I've ever seen. There was one moment where I told him, okay, so I'm like, he, terminology, right? I'm like saying, I'm just a close up, whatever. So I'm like explaining slowly. So he's saying, okay, now we're doing a close up, like we're shooting close on your hand when you pick up your glasses, okay? So it's very easy, you just pick up the glasses. So the first time he does it, so he does like, something like kind of overacting, so he's like, mm -mm -mm -mm. I found the glasses. It's like, oh, I'm searching for the glasses because I'm blind. And I'm like, okay, I'm telling my cameraman, okay, okay, I need to go explain. So I go to him like, Dad, it's really close, so like, your hand is overacting. <laughs> he looks at me, huh? Like, like you know, just, just take the glasses, like, Nothing more, just very simple. And I have to say that only once, once, this is the amazing, seriously, I've worked with actors who overacted in every shot. And this man immediately understood what I was saying and stopped doing it and he was the most natural actor I've seen on camera 
and when the sun comes out, you have to see it. <laughs> so, on that note, I'm learning from how our teachers about our family and ourselves. Yes. I want to thank you so much for coming to be here with us, and thank you all for being here. As thank well. you for coming. I'm so glad you're here.